Good morning, New Life. It is so great to see you all in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's rise to our feet and worship the God that we love and serve and give honor and glory and praise. There's a, a lot of things that are going, I mean, everybody has a lot of things going on in their life, but it's just um, something that's uh, the overwhelmingness of life in a lot of people's lives. I have a neighbor that committed suicide last week. Um, there's uh, uh, people that have passed away because of COVID, and it just seems like the overwhelmingness of life, I, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that I, I have joy. Um, I, I, I'm grateful that I, I, I love what it is that I do. I mean, I've got a great church family. I've got great support. Um, but I see, like, my daughter, who's doing fantastic with her work, um, but she's overwhelmed. Um, my neighbor took his life. He's overwhelmed. I, I, I really want to know, 
even with my own husband, how it is that I can recognize that and how to help. It's on my heart. I just, there's, I mean, I should have seen something coming with my neighbor. I should have seen, you know, how do I advise my daughter who's 800 miles away? You know, how, how, I, I, I want to I know how I can be salt and light in the hands of people. So just, I, I guess, ultimately I'm asking for wisdom and to be able to have the heart of God and the eyes of God to be able to see. And it's the same for my husband. You know, life just seems overwhelming and I want to help. So. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for our dear sister and her husband, yes. her children, and her neighbor. <laughs> Father, we just come before you. We thank you for our dear sister, Father. We thank you for the commitment that she makes to be up here, Father. I enjoy hearing her voice, Father. I enjoy her watching her praise the Lord. I thank you for her. Father, thank you for Jimmy and what he means to this place, this congregation, and to your kingdom. And Father, first and foremost, I, I, I pray for the bonds of love that exist between them, that they just continue to flourish, strengthen, and grow. And Father, that they learn how to support and encourage one another in the overwhelming prospect of life. So, Father, I pray that they're able to lean upon each other and learn of each other and that their marriage would serve as a living witness and testimony of what God can do in the midst of someone's life. Father, of course, we uphold her. Uh, uh, Amanda as well, Father, just pray for her, Father. Pray that you would continue to work in her life, Father, and that, that even though she's very, very busy, Father, that the overwhelmingness of life, uh, Father, would not press in so hard that she might lose her faith that that basic belief that there is a God and there is a Christ who cares for me will carry her through. Father, I pray that you break through any barriers, any walls, Father, and just let your light shine. Father, I pray for the neighbors and the neighborhood, Father, that gets affected and infected by such a tragedy. And so, Father, I, I pray that your comforting, healing presence may be known and may it shine right out of Jim and Barbara's household. May they find the words to speak. May they find opportunity to just be in silence with someone. May your spirit minister into each and every family around that neighborhood. Father, can we broaden it to ourselves also? Many of us feeling the overwhelming burden of life. Pandemic financial frustrations. Father, do your work within us. Bring the peace that only you can bring. Bring us the comfort and the wisdom and the discernment that you promise to give if we ask by your Holy Spirit in the name of your Son. Amen. God bless you. Continue to pray uh, all week for that. You also wanted to make an announcement or two, didn't you? I noticed uh, on the, the um, table out there that um, the blood bank is going to be here next week. I'm grateful to see this because that means that I, I know I need to take iron and <laughs> eat a good breakfast that morning, that sort of thing. So uh, that the, looks like the, um, the big red bus will be here next week. That's Sunday the 10th. And um, we had yesterday um, Tom and Nancy Wheeler and myself and Jeff and Anais, they came out and, and to show support from New Life Alliance for the Walk for Life. And it was really great. And Tom and Nancy asked if I would um, say something about how really overwhelming we are. Sure, we went to a church that hosted it, and they have thousands of people that are there, and they had all kinds of awards and prizes and whatnot. But for the body that we are, they said that we are very, very huge and generous givers. Um, our um, gift to First Life was $750 just for the Walk for Life yesterday. And they wanted to say a, very much a thank you. And we carried the banner, which also was a, um, a, a testament to our sweet Patsy, who is no longer with us. And um, anyway, um, we had a, a really nice walk yesterday. And I think there was some, oh, it was the, um, the um, end of the month, we're going to have the um, better than, not better than Halloween, it's going to be trunk or treat. And uh, that same afternoon, right after church, there will be a, whatever you want to call it, potluck dinner for, um, this is also, um, I'm doing a terrible job with this, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not a good speaker. 
um, doing the uh, um, Pastor's Appreciation Month. Thank you. And we're going to have a fellowship right immediately after church on the 31st. And then later on that night, it'll be the, um, the trunk or treat. So I don't know if there's a sign-up list or anything, but, um, oh, and one more thing. Miss Lydia is going to make an, an announcement. Is that also regarding the youth uh, fundraiser that's going on? Okay, great. Miss Lydia, take it over, please. <laughs> oh, hey. So, speaking of trunk or treat, I have a blank sheet of paper here. I need 12 or more cars for the trunk or treat to be a success. Because you don't want kids being all excited to come to a trunk or treat and there's like five lame old cars there. Not that the cars would be lame, but that there's only five. So, we need a dozen. And I'm going to have a sign-up sheet in the foyer on the table for you to sign up your car, truck, van, motor scooter, whatever you want to do. I don't care. So what I also want to see from the congregation is candy donations because we want to be able to provide lots and lots and lots of candy for all those cavities. And <laughs> so as far as the four nights of Halloween, we have flyers so that you can hand out to friends, family, coworkers, whomever, if they want to come out and sit on the lawn and, and watch a fun movie, okay? So this Wednesday is Hocus Pocus, and then after that will be Halloween Town, The Haunted Mansion, and Frank and Weenie. These are all family friendly, don't worry. Um, and they're gonna be selling hot dogs, cotton candy, beverages, free popcorn, it's a great fundraiser for the youth. It'll be fun. And that's it. Now, check this out. Praise the Lord. Let's all rise and praise the living God. The scripture says that God is love and we are his children. So we are children of love as well. We love you, Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise you, Lord. Trying to satisfy my soul All the lies I believed in Left me crying like a rain Now I saw lightning from heaven And I'll never be the same I'm gonna climb a mountain I'm gonna shout about it I am a child of love I found a world of freedom I found a friend of Jesus
child of love, how will the world know that we are his disciples unless we love one another? Holiness, oh God, is what we long for. It's what we need. Draw us closer to your heart, oh God.
refines our will. Refine us, O oh God. Purify our hearts to be more like you, O oh Lord, to live for you. Our thoughts, our actions, deeds, take hold of our lives, O oh God. Shine through us, O oh Lord, so many will know you.
Lord. Draw us close, O oh Jesus. Closer to your heart, O oh God. We need more of you individually and corporately as your body, O oh God. Change our hearts and our minds. Just work within us, O oh God. More of you and less of us, O oh Lord. Holy Spirit, teach us and guide us and lead us. Burn away the dross, O oh God. Lead us in your way, not our way, your way. Let us be more in tune with you, Holy Spirit, O oh God. We give you praise and we worship you. We pray for the reading of the word, O oh Lord. Let us have ears to hear, O oh God, and open hearts. And we pray for the message today, O oh Lord, that you will speak through Pastor Stan. And it'll be the word that we need to hear for this very day, oh God. We love you, Jesus. Let's do Refiner's Fire Chorus one more time. Refiner's Fire. My heart's. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down it down, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have completely forgotten the word, this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, 
My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm. To a trumpet blast or such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you for that dramatic reading. Step. Excellent. All right. Do we have people for this? All right. So we realize that which is perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. That which is mortal cannot inherit immortality. Just so we're clear about the things that are shaken and the things that remain. Now that was kind of a little bit last week's message, a little bit of tangible 
versus intangible. So last week we discussed uh, Hebrews 11. And that was the, the faith hall of fame chapter. The faith of these Old Testament followers demonstrated the faith that was credited to them. And the world was not worthy of them. And therefore, since we have this great cloud of witnesses, this great assembly of men and women with such tremendous faith, we should follow their example. That's basically what it's saying. We're surrounded by people with great faith. And here are some examples. And throw off every hindrance, every sin that binds, every sin that might entangle you. Walk in faith like these people did. Walk in faith as best you can. And while they all had great faith, if you know their stories, you also know they had their issues, didn't they? That alone should give us great encouragement that we don't have to be perfect, but we at least need to try like they did. But we can look at them and go, well, they weren't perfect, but God is you know, commending their faith. One of the things that we're going to have to get really good at, though, I believe, is removing the snares, removing the traps, removing all the distractions. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So here's your first one, remove the snares. You're going to have to remove the snares that trip us up. Following the example of the faithful, lay aside every weight, every hindrance, that entanglement that might cause you or lead you into sin. Don't let anything hold you back from fulfilling that which God desires for you. Don't let sin trip you up. One of the worst ones that people get tripped up in is I'm not good enough. My faith isn't strong enough. We trip over ourselves. You be tripping, man. Don't fall into this, I'm unworthy, I'm unforgivable, I'm too much of a sinner. I invited someone to church and they said, I can't go to church, I'm too much of a sinner. Is that really the reputation of the church? For people that do not come to church, they cannot come to church because they're too much of a sinner. Who's the church for? Is it a safe haven for the saint or a hospital for the sinner? Yes. So here in this place, maybe we want to check our own attitude a little bit. Are sinners welcome here? Those that are dealing with shame, guilt, not at the right place where they want to be in life, and they come here seeking and searching, and then we judge them because of where they're at in their life. We don't commend their faithfulness in seeking. This is one of the many issues that snares that really kind of creep in quickly. There's a lot of self-blame and self-doubt and self-criticism and self-loathing and, and God doesn't like me and I know the church doesn't like me and I can't go there. What are some of the things that would break your faith? What makes you doubt? What makes you fall into sin, fall into the traps? What's your distraction? Maybe it's not a what. Maybe it's a who. Maybe it's not a what or a who. Maybe it's a you. Maybe it's a who from Whoville. Maybe it's a you from Youville. I'm going to have to put on my Yuhu hat here. Some may call you friends, but they are really not. Some want to trip you up and 
tie you in a knot. Friends may not be friends, and not in the least. Strangers could be friends, or the big scary beast. Wherever you go, whatever you might do, be certain that you do not have a scary beast in tow. Beasts will lie, and beasts will trick you to dare. But don't fall for their trickery. It's all just a snare. So, trick or treat, tick for tats, avoid the snares, and beware the beastly traps. And don't forget, the traps may not be a what, but a who. And it may not be a they or a them. It may be a you. So what kind of snares can you identify in your life? Let's leave that there for everybody to ponder. What kind of hindrances trip you up? Do the sins of others cause you to sin? Do the behavior of other people cause you such frustration that it leads you to sin? What kind of beasts are surrounding you and keep you from the life that the Lord wants you to live? External? Internal. Maybe a little bit of both. For certain, there are all kinds. There's blame. Blame it on the others. Blame it on the Democrats. Blame it on the Republicans. Blame it on global warming. Fear. Talk about being overwhelmed. People are overwhelmed with fear. Distrust, anger, gossip, resentment, unforgiveness, drugs, sex, greed, pride, arrogance, hatred. What's tripping you? You be tripping, man. There are a multitude of traps that the enemy would like to ensnare you with. And listen, what is a trap for me may not be a trap for you. So please, don't judge my weakness based on your strengths. What things I've beaten back and overcome, you may be struggling with. And aren't we supposed to help each other along the way? Aren't we supposed to be a cloud of witnesses for each other and with each other to encourage each other to move to the cross? If we leave the judgment behind, we can walk with people from victory to victory, from victory to victory. But lest it be known, there is no victory without a battle. Are you willing to walk with people in the battle, or do you just want to stand next to them when they claim the victory? you got to be willing to walk with them in the battle. We can move away from judgment of people that are caught in a snare and, and move towards helping each other to heal. We need each other to help guide through this minefield of sins and overwhelming scenarios that are taking place in our own lives. And so one of the methods that I've used over many years, just in my own kind of head, is RIP. R I think I might have a slide. Is that R.I.P.? Give me the next slide. R.I.P. It's kind of not the rest in peace thing. It's the rip. Rip it and grip it, right? This is not that kind of. This is a, a R.I.P. that it's an acronym. And the first one, recognize it. Recognize it. What does that mean? Well, there's no trap or snare if you don't see the trap or the snare. If you don't see it, it doesn't exist for you. If you don't think you are in sin, then you don't see the trap that you're in. See, if you make this kind of like self-degradation part of your life every day, every time you look in the mirror, will you even begin to see the damage that you're doing to yourself over and over and over and over again? You say things to yourself 
that God never says about you. And you beat yourself up over and over and over and over again. The problem may not be out there. The problem may not be with God. The problem may lie within. I hate my life. I hate my job. I hate my kids. I hate my car. I hate this house. I hate the president. I hate this country. I hate my furniture. I hate this church. I hate these people. I hate my life altogether, all around. So how are you doing today? Oh, I'm all right. <laughs> w- would you say that you're a hater? Oh, no, I love everybody. Oh, that's good, yeah. yeah. You love everybody. You're kind and compassionate and generous. Oh, yeah, that's me. I'm, I'm a good person, yeah. To everybody but yourself. To everybody but yourself. See, without recognition of the problem, there's no problem in your eyes. This is very evident when you see couples come before you. Marriage couples that are struggling. One sees a problem, the other goes, what problem? See, that's a problem. But if you don't see it, no problem. See, an alcoholic will never call himself an alcoholic until he recognizes the problem. You with me? So if you were ever to you know, grace the AA meeting, you'd, you'd sit in a circle and a time to share, and when it became your time to share, hi, I'm Jason, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jason, right? That's how it flows. Why? Awareness, recognition, the acceptance of who you are, the acceptance of the scenario. A person struggling with greed will not say that they're greedy. They will never recognize that within themselves and their own self-centered behavior. They just won't be generous. They won't tie. They won't give. They'll be trapped in the snare of self-preservation and fear of financial failure. The struggle's real. And the struggle's in the church. (laughs) Because what's here is people. The struggle's not out there. The struggle's in your own heart. If you do not do the self-awareness of your own life, your own whoville, your own youville, you will not grow. You will not change. You will not know that it is you who is strange. Recognize the pitfalls that are in your own life so you can overcome them. But you won't overcome that which you don't feel as if you there's even a thing to overcome. See, in the last chapter, those Hall of Famers, they had, they had to. There was a lot that they had to overcome. There's a lot I've had to overcome. There's going to be a lot you're going to have to overcome. And so I just want to make sure that we put it all on the table, that we're all on the same page. And so as I look at you, I'm looking all at you in the eyeballs, I'm speaking to every one of you. So if you're looking at me, or if you're not, you're just avoiding me, but I'm looking at you. Hear me loud and clear. You got issues. You got issues. Just so that we're all on the same page. We all have issues. We're all dysfunctional. There's not one of us that's good. There's certainly not one of us that's good enough. So once again, we find ourselves in this great cloud of witnesses, all finding our way together. We're all at different places. We're all at different moving at different paces. And we're all the same, but you have different faces. Eyes for investigate. R.I.P. Eyes for investigate. Now, if you can see that maybe, maybe I've been a little bit greedy. Maybe I have been self-absorbed. Maybe I do have an alcoholic problem and I need to work on that. Maybe I've been a womanizer way too long in my life. Maybe I am very self-degrading. 
maybe I am just dysfunctional. See, the investigating part is to, once you have this awareness, and <laughs> now what? Why is it so? Why do I have these kind of issues? Why did I fall into this deep pit? Why do I have this scary beast in tow? Do I have security issues that stem from my abandonment and as a fa from my father leaving me early in my life? Do I have to accumulate wealth to prove myself to my mama or to earn the love of my spouse? Do I think that money will solve all my issues and all my problems? Do I have suicidal tendencies that grow out of emotional stress and isolation? Investigate why you're, you know, why you're landing where you're landing and why you're becoming aware of certain things in your life that you need to overcome. Why is it that you react instead of respond? Why is it that I cry at every Little House on the Prairie show? <laughs> Family of origin issues? My daddy beat my mommy, and that's just the way men treat women. My daddy beat me. I beat my kids. I turned out all right. Did you? Did you? You're okay. Recognition is half the battle. Investigating will lead you the rest of the way to healing. Now, unfortunately, I've seen this way too often. The secular world will love to make a living at drawing all about your psychoanalysis. They love to do that. You're going to become part of the system. It's going to take years of therapy. It's going to take some good psychotic meds. We're going to work this all out. We will investigate. There'll be lots of psychotherapy. I'm going to need to see you every Tuesday and every Thursday. And don't worry about it. We're going to bill your insurance company. We'll get to the root of this. We'll get to the root of all the dysfunction that's going on in your life. <laughs> We've all got issues. We all should be lined up at the therapist with our insurance card out. Let me save you a lot of money. Let me save you a lot of time at the therapist's office. Here's some ideas that might grab hold of you. I don't know. It's probably true for all of us. Your mama weaned you too soon and kept you in the crib too long. There you go. We all got dysfunction. We're all dysfunctional. We all got similar, the same problem. I'm going to save you a lot of time and a lot of therapy. We all got a sin problem. We got a sin problem. We've got a sin problem. You have a sin problem. You have a sin problem. You have a sin problem. This world has a sin problem. And it's decaying. And it's rotting away. Much like your own flesh. It will be shaken, as it should be. If you do not acknowledge the sin in your life, if you do not have Jesus Christ in your life, then the secular world is correct. Then the secular world and its psychotherapy is right. You can begin to blame others. And you're going to need a lot of regression therapy. You're going to need a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy. You're going to need a lot of humanistic, integrative therapy. And by the way, here's a cute kitten. You need some pet therapy, too. And don't worry about how you're feeling. Here's some meds. We'll just numb you so you don't feel anything, which is just what we want from you. Are you sure that's what you want for you? Are you trying to solve your worldly problems with worldly solutions? Are you trying to solve your worldly problems with worldly solutions? The world is the problem. This flesh is the problem. Sin is the problem. I thought you had Jesus. I thought you had the power of the Holy Spirit of God within you. I thought you were a new creation. 
Old things have passed away and you've become new. I thought you had a new mind. I thought you had a new attitude and a new hope. Weren't you supposed to break the chains that bind you? You need to free yourself from yourself. Free yourself from this world of snares. Don't play the victim card over and over and over and over. Are you trying to solve your worldly problems with worldly solutions? Here's the race card. Let's play that one over and over and over. Oh, here's the abuse card. Let me play that one over and over and over. It just gives me excuses for the patterns of my behavior. Yeah, you've got all kinds of excuses. We all do. We all are dysfunctional. We all need Jesus to rid us of the sin problem in our life that might, we might become whole. Be an overcomer. Be the testimony. Write your name in the Faith Hall of Fame. And P is for position. P is for position. You're going to have to place all this somewhere. All this recognition and awareness. Yes, I've got dysfunction. Yes, uh, I an investigate. Yes, and I'm, what's the issues in the problem? You need to position all this somewhere. All this situational trauma, all this tragic circumstances, all your generational addictions, all your family of origin issues, all your environment, your afflictions, all your abuses. May I suggest you put them all at the foot of the cross? What a great place to position yourself at the foot of the cross. I can't do this, Jesus. I can't do this, Lord. What a great place to be. May I suggest you lay it all at the altar. Lay it all at the altar. Position it in the hands of Jesus. See all that stuff, that, all that dysfunction, all that, you just gather it all up. And you can pick it up and you go right at the foot of the cross. I give it to you, Jesus. I lay it all out for you. I'm holding nothing back. I'm tired of me. I'm tired of this world. I'm tired of fear. I'm tired of all the plagues and the beasts that are plaguing my mind. I'm tired of blaming my daddy and my mama and my kids and my boss. I'm tired. I'm tired. I need you, Lord, to inspire me, to change me, and to challenge me, that I might become whole in your sight. Then I can walk. I can walk in peace in this world. Then, you're, then you can RIP. Then here's your last, this next slide. Then you can rest in peace. Then you can rest in peace. Whatever the issue, you have to position it somewhere so that you can overcome it. You begin to recognize that you've got issues. Sin is the dysfunction. You place it at the foot of Jesus. You can never live at peace with others until you live at peace with yourself. You've got a lot of work to do, you will. When you come to a peace with your Creator, when you lay it all at the foot of Christ, you will find that you can overcome more than you ever thought you could you will discover that you can remain peaceful in the midst of chaos. You will understand that you have the strength to endure some of the most difficult hardships that this world could ever throw at you because the God wants you to rest in his peace. Not after you're dead. Now. And there's purpose. As hard as it is to understand, there's purpose. Consider him, and he's talking about Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners, who endured such persecution from this world. Consider him who endured such opposition from the sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, in your struggle against your dysfunction, in your struggle against this world, you have not even yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten the word, this word, his word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? 
My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts. I bring my issues to the Lord. I've got issues. Help me, Lord. And he does. And he will. Endure hardship as a discipline? Praise God, the Lord even considers you, that he hasn't turned you over to your depraved mind. He's still considering you. You can still approach him. He still wants to be involved with your dysfunction. God is treating you as children. For what children are not disciplined by their own father? If you are not disciplined, then you are not legitimate. He just turns you over. He just lets you go. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father, the Holy Spirit of God, and live? They disciplined us, our, heaven, our earthly fathers, for a little while. They thought they did what they were best at, <laughs> coming out of all their dysfunction. But God disciplines us for our own good. Learn, grow. Learn and grow. And here's a big problem I see with a lot of us. It takes all of us a while. I'm with you. It just takes all of us a while sometimes to learn. God's telling us, don't touch the hot stove. Don't go near the snare. It's probably not a good idea that four times this week you've been in the strip club. I'm telling you, it's probably not a good idea. But you go, oh, I touched the stove. Anyway, can I touch it again? Don't do, I'm telling you, don't do it. Oh. And your whole life, you're just dealing with this, don't touch the stove, don't deal with the snake. And you stay right there. God would love to introduce you to the oven. But you're stuck on the stove. You're not learning any lessons. He's disciplining you, but you're not learning the lesson. You keep going back. You keep going back to the same ways. You keep going back to the same flesh. You keep going back to the same old you. I thought you were a new creation in Christ. What's new about you since you've come to know the Lord? And for those of you that have been walking for decades and decades and decades and decades, are you the example for me? Remember the reward. This is also that we will not grow weary and lose heart. This all produces a, a harvest of righteousness and peace within you. It's not a harvest of righteousness and peace within the outside world, as if your government's now all of a sudden going to become all peaceful, and the world's all of a sudden going to start locking arms and singing kumbaya. That's not the plan for this world. Have you read the end of the book, by the way? Yeah, so God's fulfilling his plans. Are you upset about that? He's already told you. He's already expressed to you. And so we're supposed to remember the rewards that are for us. That righteousness and that holiness and the peace in the midst of all the transgression, in the midst of all the regression, in the midst of all the psychotherapy, in the midst of all the wackiness of the world. And isn't it getting more wacky? Or is it just me because I'm getting a little older? Is it getting wacky? I don't know, man. A lot of inconsistencies, right? That which is good will be bad, and bad will be good, and just all kinds of stuff. And you're going, well, that's just right out of the scriptures. So I don't, I don't know why, why we're surprised. Set apart for his good works and for his glory. This is the sanctification process within our own lives. This is the proof that God is at work in you and working in your lives. And oftentimes, he just keeps bringing you back to the same place because you haven't learned a lesson. You keep touching the stove. You keep going back to the same old, same old. You haven't grown much more. But he wants to show you more. You can't get in the fifth grade until you graduate the fourth. Some of you just get stuck. You get stuck, you get stuck, you get stuck, you get stuck, and then you start blaming others. God wants to move you off that base, excel you and advance you. And oftentimes, it looks like discipline. Oftentimes it looks pretty harsh because he's got to smack you upside the head to get your attention. You go, oh, I don't think I want to do that anymore. Yeah. You didn't catch it the first time. And remember the rewards that are there for you when you begin to move in that direction, that sanctification process. So let us run the race 
that is set out before us. Your race is very much different than my race. The things that you're dealing with are very much different than the things I'm dealing with. But we're all dealing. We're all coping. We're all dysfunctional. We're all walking to the cross together. We're all trying to lay it all down at the foot of the cross and not pick it back up again. And listen, don't try to run someone else's race. Are you living for your mama? You shouldn't be living for your mama. You living for your daddy? You shouldn't be living for you. You should be living for you and the Lord. He will guide you, lead you, and protect you. Don't try to pass me up. Don't try to catch me. Don't try to leave me behind. You set your own pace. Countless times people have gotten messages from me and they keep the pace, or you set the pace, or keep the faith, or just keep moving forward. Some of you, you need to slow down. Slow down, right? You think way too much. Talk about an overwhelmingness. You overwhelm yourself with your own thought processes. Slow down. You move too fast. You got to make the morning last. Just kicking down the cobblestones. Looking for fun and feeling groovy. ba da 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 Feeling groovy. Anybody else? that? Don't you want to wake up like that? I want to wake up like that every day. <laughs> slow down. Somebody slow down. Gosh. Well, then some of you, well, some of you just need to wake up. <laughs> Pedal to the metal, baby. You need to wake up. Get moving. Get out of bed already. Has anybody arrived at the perfect version of themselves yet? Nobody's arrived there yet. So we're all on a walk together, right? Keep running the race. Keep moving. Keep attending. Keep searching the scriptures. Keep showing up to church. Keep learning, right? Keep studying the Bible. Show up on Zoom prayer meetings. Involve yourself, right? God puts you in the family. He adopted you into the family, <laughs> this dysfunctional family. Just because you became a Christian doesn't mean, oh, my dysfunction is gone. No, Jesus is working on you to overcome all the dysfunction. It's a great place to be. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Keep learning. Keep growing. Keep gaining a deeper understanding of God. He will guide you, lead you for the betterment of yourself and for the betterment of others. Want to make the world better? You get better. You'll be the peace that the world needs. You'll be the encouragement that the world needs. Are you huddled in the corner for fear? That's not God. That's not God. That's you. End your frustration, end your worry, end racism, end divisions, end all the anxieties, end the jealousy. These are all snares that just trip you up over and over and over again, and you lose focus. Consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. He's the author of our faith. He's the one who suffered on the cross. He says, with the joy that was set before him, that you might know righteousness, that you might know holiness, that you might know what it is to be whole. He took the shame. He took your shame upon the cross. No one killed him. He gave his life. He took our infirmities. He took our sin. He took our humiliation. He took our indulgences. He took our worry. He took our addictions. He took our afflictions. He took our disease. Remember, the victory is yours. And though you might be in a battle, victory is yours. The victory is yours. Learn to walk in it. Learn to walk in it with excellence, with confidence with the assurance that God is with you. The rewards are there for you, for the taking. He's bestowed them all upon you. The blessings are already there. You are healed. You are healed. You are healed. Praise be to Jesus Christ. You're welcome. I'll send the bill to your insurance company. <laughs> oh, never mind. Jesus said, 
He already paid it. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces the harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. That's us. That's all those Hall of Fame faith believers. That's you. It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace within our own lives. This is how we are the light to the world. This is our living testimony to the world. But you're going to have to forfeit your rights and be his child. Not a child of this world. His child. Are you his child or are you just childish? Are you 50 years old and still throwing temper tantrums? Uh Uh-huh. You're either an heir of the promise or you're still victim, 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 victim. Are you an heir of the kingdom? Have you forgotten the rewards that are yours and the healing that is yours and the benefits package that comes along with saying, I'm a child of the most high living God. God has a purpose in all that he is doing and what he is doing in your life. Even if it seems a little bit tragic, even if it seems a little bit painful, even if it seems a little bit hard to bear, even if it's troubling to your own spirit, seek him. He will enlighten you. He will show you. He will reward you. He will bless you. He will give you the strength to endure. Oh, he will heal you. I don't always like that people get mercy. I want them crushed. But I'm not God. I have to trust in his ways. Not my ways and what I want. I don't like people that do things differently than I do because I'm always right in the things I do. I don't like people that vote differently than me. When I can give it all up, when I can quit the blame shifting and the accusations of others and the reason I'm the way I am is because of you, when I can give all that up, lay it all at the cross, When I surrender, I find myself more free than I've ever been. And things like anger and bitterness and frustration, all that stuff just seems so worldly and so temporary. God thinks eternally. Let's think how God thinks. Let go and let God. Stop trying to control everything and everyone. Some of you need to write that down. Put it on your refrigerator. Stop trying to control everything and everyone. And when you can, right? When you can really let it go, you'll be freer than you ever thought possible. He's with you. He has given you the promises to carry you through. What a great reward, now and forever. And therefore, since we, have, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably in reverence and in awe. For our God is a consuming fire. He will consume things. He will consume it. He will burn it out of your life. So, renew yourself. There's your last one. Renew yourself. It's kind of like people say, I'm born again. I'm born again. I am renewed. Many ways, I still need to be born again. Many ways, I'm wise as a sage. In other ways, I've yet to be born. God is still working. I haven't reached the perfect me yet. Anybody else? We're all in this together. What a great cloud of witnesses. And God has some very specific ways, like a very good daddy. He has specific ways about how you should probably handle your body, about how you should handle your money, about behavior towards others, even behavior towards your enemies. Uh, I don't like that. People get mercy. But not my way, God, your way. For us to be growing up spiritually, we don't have to do things God's way, not your way. Not the ways of the world, the ways of the Holy Spirit. And what's amazing to me is 
And what's amazing to me <laughs> is that he thinks I'm worth it. Somehow he thinks you're worth it. And I know you well enough. <laughs> I know me well enough. But he thinks you're worth it. He thinks you're worth it. And he does ask us to remember him. We move into communion. He asks us to remember him in these ways. The Eucharist, the Last Supper. Remembering what he has done for you. Remembering the healing that he has brought to you. And those who are at home want to gather their communion together. Those of us here gather our communion cups together. This is an open communion table. What does that mean? That means it's open to anyone and everyone that would say, I believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. Welcome to the family. Most of us are familiar with this story. He was gathered with his disciples and he, he gave thanks, he took the bread, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take this and eat this, for this is my body, broken for you. Let us partake together. In a very similar manner, he had taken the cup when he could peel the plastic off of it. We're going to get better at this, I promise. He took it and he gave thanks. And he said, take this and drink this. This is a cup of my blood. Shed and spilled out for the forgiveness of your sins. Thereby signifying and sealing an everlasting new covenant between God and man for the forgiveness of our sins. Let us partake. Hallelujah, my Father, for giving us your Son, sending him into the world to be given up for men. And knowing he'd be wounded and crucified on Hallelujah, my Father, in his death is my birth. May the Lord bless you. Hey, check this out.
me, please, congregation. Thank you. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day comes, not if, when the day comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to be able to stand. So, dress appropriately, rest in peace, go serve your God. God bless you guys. You're welcome.